Good morning. I am David Rosenberg, coordinator of Jewish Educational Services and Orthodox Community Liaison at JCFS Chicago. On behalf of the Orthodox Network, I would like to welcome you to our 13th Awareness and Education Forum, Recreational Marijuana and Vaping and the Orthodox Jewish Communities. The Orthodox Network is a collaboration of social service providers and Jewish agencies who work in partnership to improve services to the Orthodox community in metropolitan Chicago. Our planning committee includes Marilyn Siegel, Director of Adult and Family Services for JCFS Chicago, Ed Lowe, Assistant Director of Adult and Family Services, uh, Jeff Blumenfeld of uh, JCFS Chicago, Mark Suarez of The Ark, Miriam Ament, No Shame on You, Esther Yona Friedman of Shalva. I would like to also thank uh, Naomi Shickley of JCFS for her assistance. We appreciate the ongoing help from Amanda West and Elizabeth Llewellyn of the Department of Practice Excellence at JCFS, and Laura Olier and her colleagues at the Abe and Ida Cooper Center. I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this event, uh, including uh, JCFS Chicago, The Arc, High Lifeline, CJE Senior Life, JCC Chicago, Madrigos Midwest, Nefesh Chicago, No Shame on You, Rafua 311, and Shalva. This forum will explore several themes. How does cannabis, marijuana, and vaping affect the human body? Similarities to and distinctions from alcohol. Legal implications in the political landscape of recreational marijuana use after January 1st, 2020, rabbinic and educational impact on synagogues, schools, families, halacha, and community. We chose this topic uh, fairly uh, recently, um, uh, largely because the, the, change, the upcoming change of, or the change of law in Illinois um, has been on the minds of uh, rabbis and communal leaders at least as early as last summer. It's in the news. Uh, we've had a number of discussions with rabbinic leaders, and there's a lot of interest uh, in the Jewish community as a whole. This presentation uh, is being videotaped. It doesn't mean all of you are being videotaped, but the folks at the front are being videotaped. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and they've all signed consents for that. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, to make this a really successful experience in terms of having an ongoing record for those uh, who are not able to be here or those who would like to refer to it in future, we ask first that everyone's phones be silenced. Uh, and uh, those who are speaking it up here will use the mic, please, close to their mouth. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, the presenters are asked to press the button that says speak before speaking and, and, and then press it off. Uh, after speaking, otherwise your voice will not be picked up. And we have another mic, so those who would like to ask questions during Q&A, it's very important that we use this so that we can so that we can all hear and so it can be picked up. Very good. Uh, I would like to call up my colleague, uh, Edward Lowe, who will introduce our panelists uh, who will discuss the topic. Uh, Ed will moderate a Q&A answer period following the presentations. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if someone needs to go out and use the washrooms, there will be cards along the back desk because you need a card to get, be able to get back in. Um, so somebody went out to get them. Okay. Okay, so our first speaker today is going to be Nina Henry. Nina Henry uh, is an addiction specialist at Jewish Child and Family Services Chicago. She is an LCPC CADC. Um, and she has been working in the addiction field for more than 28 years. She received her Master's of Counseling at Northeastern University and was certified to provide addiction treatment services by the Illinois Certification Board in 1991. From 1995 until the end of 2014, Ms. Henry supervised Recovery Point, the substance use program of Community Counseling Centers of Chicago, which is also known as C4. Previously, Ms. Henry was the Senior Addiction Counselor for the Outpatient Addiction Treatment Program at University of Illinois in Chicago. And prior to that, Ms. Henry was the Addiction Counselor at Evanston Hospital, the Chapman Center. Since 2010, Ms. Henry has provided mental health first aid training. 
Um, she is the project leader for the Training of Leaders Committee, convened by the Illinois Certification Board to increase participation of treatment professionals in the addiction field. And I now hand the microphone over to Nina. To me? Yes, here we go. Thank you. So before I launch into my uh, remarks, I just wanted to make you aware of a resource that JCFS Chicago has brought along with us today. This is a parent resource guide that was put together by CTAD. That acronym stands for Community the Anti-Drug. So this isn't specific to the Orthodox community, but I think these are really very worthwhile resources. I believe the pile is up uh, on the back table there. And so feel free to grab those. If you have questions about any of these resources or frankly, any recovery support or treatment, um, I brought my business card, so please feel free to grab one or speak to me after the program briefly. So I'm going to start with some written remarks, and then I'll kind of get into all the details on marijuana and kind of make some comparisons uh, to alcohol and how we view those two substances. So our relationship with substances. We are here today because we want to be prepared for the legalization of recreational marijuana. I'm grateful to Rabbi David Rosenberg, Marilyn Siegel, and the Orthodox Network for asking me to contribute to this very important conversation. In my remarks, I will focus on two substances, marijuana and alcohol, and I'll talk a little bit about vaping. It is my intention to give you facts about these substances, how they are different, and how they may be similar. However, this seems insufficient information. We need to have a way to think about these other substances Everything, we, have, we need to have a way to think about all substances, everything from sugar to coffee to heroin. What are our relationships with substances? What leads us to use, to diet, or abstain? Is it to defy authority as some, a choice that some adolescents make? Is it to medicate sad or angry feelings? Are we desperate due to chronic pain, fatigue, or some other malady? Is it consistent with our beliefs and our values? When we seek to answer these questions, we recognize that it isn't so much the substance, but the context in which this substance is used and how we're motivated to use them. All in all, it's hard to make sound choices when we don't have good information, so that's my role here today. With that in mind, let's dig into the information that will help lead us toward a healthy relationship with these and other, sub these and other substances. So, what is marijuana? All right. For one thing, it's certainly not our parents' marijuana. It's very different than it was back when I was in college, which was a long time ago. <laughs> um, first of all, marijuana is the most used substance behind alcohol and tobacco. Marijuana contains psychoactive properties, but there are some compounds contained in marijuana that are not psychoactive. To understand how marijuana acts in our body, we have to understand the system in our body that it acts on. It's something called the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is the neurons, and neurons are these things that we have in our brains, but actually all throughout our body that um, help us respond to stimulus. So the neurons volume control, that's what the endocannabinoid system is. It dampens our neuron activity when it is too strong. It regulates uh, levels of important neurotransmitters that affect pleasure, mood, pain, appetite, motivation, memory, etc. And it helps keep neuron activity in balance, not underactive or overactive. So in essence, the endocannabinoid system sort of plays a role in homeostasis, in maintaining the body's balance. So two components in marijuana, ones that were probably, there's like 500 different components in marijuana, but the two that we tend to be most familiar with, hear the most about and most concerned about are THC, which is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and that's the last time I'm going to use that long name, uh, and that's the psychoactive stuff that's in marijuana. It's responsible for most of the intoxicating effects. It activates parts of the brain that contain the highest number of these can cannabinoid receptors, and this causes the high that people feel. And then the other substance, CBD, is cannabidiol, and it stimulates production of natural cannabinoids throughout the body. 
So CBD is a newer kind of substance on the scene. We're hearing more and more about it all the time. And uh, in, the, in the sense that CBD stimulates the endocannabinoid system, it is being looked at and researched as a means for pain management and uh, to help. Uh, it, actually, there is a um, FDA-approved medication that contains CBD that uh, actually addresses uh, pediatric epilepsy. So there are very few well-researched uses of uh, the components of marijuana, particularly THC and uh, CBD. So when someone smokes marijuana, and I'm specifically talking about smoking it or vaping it, THC gets into the brain rapidly and attaches to those cannab cannabinoid receptors in your brain. But what THC does is it kind of overwhelms the endocannabinoid system. It prevents those natural cannabinoids from doing their job properly and throws everything off balance. So how do we use marijuana? So most commonly it's inhaled in smoke or vapor. It's ingested in foods. And when THC is ingested in foods, this is problematic. Whereas THC, when smoke gets into your brain quickly, when you eat something that contains THC, it doesn't act as quickly in the body. So someone that eats something that has an ingestible may not feel the effects right away. And they'll think, hmm, it's not working. You know what? I'm going to take another bite. And what happens is then they compound the effects of the THC and they may experience something in, akin to an overdose. So it can be, the edibles can be a little dangerous. And I'll get into a little bit, and I think some of my fellow speakers will also talk about the fact that some of these doses are also not very well controlled at present. So, uh, so we ingest and, uh, also there's ointments and tinctures, tinct, tinct, Oh, goodness gracious. So things that we, you know, so lotions and things that we can rub on our skin. Um, so the desired effect when someone is uh, using marijuana, some of the desired effects include relaxation, elevated mood, drowsiness, sedation, altered sense of time, belief one has experienced increased insight. This is not real increased insight. It's only perceived increased insight. And of course, we've been begun to find that people are using uh, marijuana, both THC and CBD, increasingly for pain relief. The negative effects include anxiety, increased heart rate, lung damage, which uh, is four times greater than cigarette tobacco smoke, and testicular cancer. Mental health effects include apathy or lack of motivation, poor concentration, memory loss, and paranoia. Chronic daily use can cause very serious problems, including increases in the likelihood of schizophrenia in adolescent males, and there is very, very good research that backs that up. So what's the withdrawal from marijuana? So, and this is for worried parents that are wondering, what am I looking for? Irritability, restlessness, nervousness, decreased appetite, insomnia, can't sleep. Marijuana is fat soluble and therefore stays in your system a long time, which can cause much akin to LSD flashbacks. You can have a marijuana flashback because it's held in your fat and until which time your body is acting on that particular fat cell, you may not experience the high that's produced by the chemical that's in that cell. Uh, so other effects. Uh, so now I want to take just a moment. Uh, I could probably do the whole morning on high potency cannabis. So not only is it not your parents' weed, it's not weed. It's high potency uh, THC, and it's the cannabis of choice amongst adolescents. Um, euphemistically, it's known as dabs, wax, vape cartridges, and probably a lot of you have heard about that, vape cartridges and edibles. Um, if you want to Google it, you'll see it. It almost looks like amber. It's oftentimes refined in such a way so that it looks clear and it looks waxy, which is why it gets that street name of wax. Um, and it often is put in the cartridges for the vape pens. Um, so, and be aware also, this is something that I really, I'm going to be honest with you, I only, I'm, we're all kind of trying to, um, get this very high, you know, very steep learning curve on marijuana and vaping. Um, you know, it's almost confounds common sense that Juul and other companies are making these vape pens because we, we've known for a long time that oil is toxic 
to our lungs. And the medium for getting the, these chemicals in our lungs is oil in these vape pens. So we're actually really causing some uh, significant harm to our lungs if we're vaping. So uh, other, you know, some really quickly other effects of THC, THC include altered senses, altered sense of time, changes in mood, impaired body movement, difficulty with thinking and problem solving, impaired memory, hallucinations when taken in high doses, so hence that high potency THC might cause some hallucination and delusions and psychosis. Um, so currently, if you go to obtain medical marijuana from a licensed dispensary, there's a considerable variability of THC concentration. Um, it can vary anywhere from 3% to 75%, and you do not receive, it's not like when you're getting an antibiotic where you get a specific dose, or you know, when I get Lipitor, I get 10 milligrams of Lipitor, right? When you get a, a prescription from a doctor, you get a medical dispensary card, and this enables you to go into a dispensary and you really can get anything that's on the shelf. And the folks that, you know, I'm hopeful, and we'll talk more about what's being legislated in that regard, right now the folks are not all necessarily very well trained to know what the effects of these substances are and what will happen at various doses. So uh, I think as time goes on, I'm hopeful that we'll you know, be a little bit more assiduous about, um, about regulating that stuff. Um, and you know, as as I said, the marijuana of today is way more potent than it was back when you know 40 years ago when I was in college. So we're going to take a brief detour and talk really not too long about alcohol. I think most of us are pretty familiar with alcohol. We know, I believe most of you know that it's a central nervous system depressant. Hence, it's 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 really a sedative in liquid form. Uh, alcohol directly affects brain chemistry by altering levels of neurotransmitters, chemical messengers that transmit signals throughout the body that control thought processes, behavior, and emotion. Alcohol affects both excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. So it's, you know, it, it levels off the excitatory stuff and it increases the inhibitory stuff. So, uh, and, and those two uh, neurotransmitters that are responsible for that are glutamate and GABA. We mostly drink it. Take me away to the side and ask me about the other uses. I, it's not really for publication, it's, uh, but there are other uses besides oral. Um, desired effects uh, are relaxation, reduced anxiety. You feel, when you drink, you feel mellow, right? Uh, negative effects include lightheadedness, vertigo or loss of balance, drowsiness, slurred speech, impaired muscle coordination, and memory loss. With hypnotics, sometimes it has a paradoxical or opposite effect. So if you're taking it in conjunction with hypnotics, you'll get anger, nightmares, and hostility. Hypnotics are really not out there anymore, so I'm almost sorry that I mentioned that because I don't want to confuse the issue. Uh, withdrawal is um, nausea, headache, seizure, hangovers, right? Um, psychosis, delirium tremens, which is really the condition that is potentially fatal when you're withdrawing from alcohol. And that's actually an important point. You can die from overdose of alcohol, either using too much and it becoming toxic in your system and causing your uh, respiratory function to collapse. Um, and it also, can, it, when you're in withdrawal, it can, you know, increase your bodily activity to such a degree that you actually can die from seizure, uh, from withdrawal from alcohol. Interestingly, something that is relatively new information for me, the re, I, I knew that you are unlikely to die from overdose of marijuana. You can definitely overdose on it, but you're unlikely to die from it because those cannabinoid receptors that I mentioned earlier, you don't have any in your brain stem. And so your brain stem is where all the primary bodily functions are controlled. So the marijuana doesn't affect your primary bodily function. So you're not going to die from overdose of marijuana. So uh, just a little bit more, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues over here. So marijuana versus alcohol. So the area where uh, there's the most notable, noticeable difference and similarities is how they're perceived by all of us and by society at large. Alcohol is widely seen as a social lubricant. We've heard that phrase, I'm sure, many times over the course of our lives, and it's generally accepted. In Jewish religious practice, wine plays an important role and is viewed quite differently from marijuana in that context. 
Marijuana up to now has been widely accepted, but due to legalization has increased, has gained increased social acceptance. So there's a, a survey that's done annually. It's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. They call it NIDSA for short. Um, and that shows the most recent survey that I saw, uh, the 2018 survey shows that 30.6% of respondents perceive great risk from smoking marijuana versus 68.5% of respondents perceiving great risk of drinking. So people actually think drinking is a riskier thing to do than marijuana. Among respondents between 12 and 17, the perceived risk has decreased since the last NUTSA survey, which was in 2017. The same study shows a marked increase in cannabis use disorder among 18 to 25 years old. So now we have to talk just briefly about addiction potential because there's actually some people out there still that don't think that, you know, they think, well, just it's, it's just psychologically addicting. No. It, yes, it is psychologically addicting, but is also very much so a uh, something that you can become physically uh, addicted to. So what is addiction? So at the risk of being too simplistic, when you are diagnos diagnosing any mental problem, mental health problem, including substance use disorders, there's one main thing you're looking for, and ears up, parents, because this is a really simple way to begin to detect that something's going on, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, or some other substance, is, is the person functioning normally? Are they, does the person have frequent hangovers, therefore causing them to be late for work or to be absent? Have you noticed your loved one frequently has dilated pupils and is less able to concentrate on their work or, if a student, homework? How are their relationships? Do they show up for important events, social or religious? Are they withdrawn or depressed? Or so anxious they cannot cope with the normal expectations of their lives? This is where we can say alcohol and marijuana are similar. There is potential for both substances to cause difficulties with function. So both are potentially addictive. It is generally agreed that alcohol is addictive, yet the myth still exists that marijuana is not. Approximately 30% of active marijuana users meet criteria for cannabis use disorder. One in 10 adults and one in six adolescents develop cannabis use disorder. It's pretty big percentages. All major scientific and medical organizations agree that marijuana is addictive. It is likely that legalizing recreational use of marijuana will uh, result in an uptick of interest in, in, and in use of marijuana. So how will our community respond? Perhaps we should take a hard look at our relationship with these and other substances and work to develop a healthy attitude towards them. Most important is our increasing efforts to help our children understand that Jewish values can guide them toward healthy choices. Thanks. Thank you, Nina. So um, when you were talking about, uh, you know, beware parents, you know, you said parents should pay attention to this. So one of my kids said to me later on in their lives, um, so, oh, okay, so now I get why there was always either you or mommy was sitting up at night waiting for us to come home and we got a hug when you walked in the door. And I was like, oh, so it wasn't just because you loved us. You were just trying to see whether you could smell something. But um, okay, well, and now, and now he, he has been working with addiction, so... Here we go. Okay. So our next two speakers um, are Mara Ruff and Suzanne Strasberger from the Federation. Um, over her career, Mara, in her various roles as an advocate, lawyer, and government affairs specialist, has represented Chicago's most vulnerable populations. Mara currently serves as Director of Local Government Affairs at the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago, leading the Federation's advocacy efforts at city and county levels and assists Federation's Springfield office. Prior to the Jewish Federation, Mara was a staff attorney at Lifespan Center for Legal Services, where she represented victims of domestic violence and divorce, custody, and civil order of protection, and worked at the Cook County Office of the Public Guardian as an attorney and guardian ad litem, representing abused and neglected children in foster care. Mara began her career as an AmeriCorps volunteer at the Legal Aid Chicago, working as a domestic violence advocate. 
Mara is also a leader in her community, serving on local and national boards, including Resilience, Equal Justice Works in Washington, D.C., and the Jewish Coalition Against Sex Trafficking, which is JCAST. Mara currently serves as the second vice president of, on the executive board of Decalogue Society of Lawyers, the Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart's Tolerance Council, and the City of Chicago's Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. A proud Sox fan. Okay. We'll just let that sink in for people. And in an four, Mara is a graduate of Ithaca College and Valparaiso University School of Law. Suzanne, who she is, she's going, Suzanne and Mara will be tag teaming from what I understand. Suzanne Strasburger joined the Federation in 2010, building on a 25 year experience in lobbying, coalition building, and public policy develop, development at Metropolitan Family Services. Educated at Grinnell College and the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, she has served on many statewide task forces and non-profit non boards and is a founding member of the Illinois Partners for Human Service. As a JUF state lobbyist, Suzanne spends five months a year in Springfield working on behalf of the affiliates who receive over $400 million a year in government funding to help more than 300,000 Chicago area residents. She also lobbies on issues of importance to the Jewish community and, in 2015, helped lead the successful fight to become the first state in the United States to pass the anti-boycott, divestment, the BDS legislation. Mara and Suzanne, the microphone is yours. Yes. Sure. Okay. Hi. Um, before Suzanne comes up here, I thought it would be helpful to give some context of the Government Affairs Committee and what we do in Federation. Um, as you're aware, Federation does a million different things and people know Federation in different ways. Um, and a lot of people aren't really familiar with our government affairs work. So the government affairs department does three main things. Advocate on behalf of health and human services agenda, provide educational opportunities for communities, and also acts as a resource for our agencies and Jewish Federation. Um, to, pro to provide some context on how we're structured, the government affairs committee is part of the public affairs department, so you might hear that, um, which is twofold. There's the community relations side, the Jewish Community Relations Council, and then there's our side, the Government Affairs Department. And we're staffed by four, four people. We have an office in D.C. that's staffed by a D.C. lobbyist and a legislative associate. And then Suzanne staffs us in Springfield and then myself in Chicago. Um, we are an agency, Federation has maybe 70 agencies under our umbrella. Um, we, as you heard, we get $400 million of government funding every year. Um, we have a physical footprint in the city. Uh, we're in 26 out of 50 wards and in 10 out of 17 county districts. So we have a very significant footprint. Um, and we're also in 24 state representative districts and 15 state senate districts. Um, some of our main agencies, as you may know, is uh, Sinai Health System, JCFS, CJE, JCC, Spurtis, Ezra, The Ark, et cetera. There's many of us. Um, and regardless of how much money that JOF raises in the annual campaign every year, we can't do this work without the partnership of government. So government partners are very important to us. Um, and also since 1975, as you might know, the Federation has administered the state refugee social services program as well. Um, <clears throat> the Government Affairs Department, we have maybe like four to six meetings a year on various different topics. Um, the, the next one coming up is actually very similar to this one. Um, sometimes we bring in, whether it be aldermen or state representatives or people to decipher the state budget, um, depending on what's going on. So we have four to six. And then we have um, special meetings with elected officials that are running for current elected officials and then those that are running for office. So we meet with several people running for candidates before the actual election. Um, the municipal elections was very busy. I think we had 16 meetings in six weeks. Um, and then we have, each year we have a mission in DC and then also in Springfield. I know Mark Suarez came the last couple, this past year and brought a couple board members and our agenda is very varied from year to year. Um, this year we talked about 
there was an issue with Medicaid determination and redetermination. A lot of clients at our agencies were falling off Medicaid um, for various reasons. So that was part of our agenda, increasing rates for health and human services. Um, and then we've, the last couple of years, we've expanded our agenda to include mental health and also gun safety. So um, it's a very awesome trip. If anyone's interested, let us know. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it over to Suzanne, who's going to talk more about the history and how this came about on the state level. Hi, Mara. Thank you. We are definitely a team. Um, so I'm Suzanne Strasberger, and I um, wanted to start off by saying three caveats before I speak. The first is we are not experts on this at all. In fact, a year ago, I was asked to predict what would come up with the new governor and so forth, and I made a specific point of saying this whole topic was going to be coming up, and we would never take a position on it. So um, the second is it is very unknown about how to best regulate this. We're the 11th state, I think, to do this. It People just don't know really what's the best way to, to control this going forward. There's a lot to learn out there, and so we're in the process. And then thirdly, I did not know I was supposed to be talking about the regulatory process and, and the regulations. So just to let you know, so by our November 1st, um, November 21st meeting where we are also talking about this at the Government Affairs Committee, we will know a lot more. I'm hoping to get Toy Hutchinson, who's going to be the new POT czar, to be one of the speakers and was very, impl very influential in building this. It's hard to find out, though. She just went from being a senator to being in the governor's cabinet, and no one seems to know where she's located. So just saying, I may have to come up with either um, someone else who was involved in the legislation. But the legislator, the regulatory process is usually is 90 days, so they must have already started publishing it. But I haven't seen it in the rulemaking process. So it may be that they'll delay it because that's usually kind of how it goes. Basically, though, the rules are set to sort of mirror what went on with what goes on with alcohol so that it will not be legal until you're 21. And that was just made a lot of sense to people. So. History of Cannabis Legislation in the State. In 2013, medical marijuana was passed. It set up the system for how to dispense it. Um, it was implemented in 2014. There was an exhaustive process. There does not, I have not heard any complaints about that. Basically, I think they feel like it, it's, it sort of set the framework. They know how to regulate it. They know how to grow it. They know how to package it. And people are pleased with that. So then it sort of that then started the groundwork for recreational marijuana. There are basically six drivers that drove this. This is not any one um, push. The first were the cannabis entrepreneurs. That's all I can think of. This is like, I, I was, I, you know, I don't, I was, I'm shocked by how much excitement there is in the business community. It's going to create opportunities to sell a product that people want sold. It's going to create opportunities, lots of opportunities, apparently, for lawyers to get involved. It's going to create marketing opportunities. It's going to create, you know, there's numerous lovely things. The J Jewish, JUF Jewish Federation actually had a session just on sort of being pitched to people who are interested in getting into the business. They had to shut down enrollment at 150 people. I mean, it was like amazing. And it, and you know, stupid me, I didn't think about it that that was going to happen. So that was like one of the drivers are the cannabis entrepreneurs. Um, the second drivers, though, were people who are looking for restoration, restorative justice. The, an ACLU 2013 study found that in Illinois, blacks and whites use cannabis roughly at the same right, rate, but blacks are 7.56 more likely to be arrested to it, for it. So in other words, for every one white person arrested, 7.5 blacks will be arrested for the same criteria. People were pretty angry about that. I did know from friends of mine whose kids um, grew up in the city that if they were arrested in a group, the white kid always got to hold the marijuana 
because they were likely not to be prosecuted in the same way the black kid was. So that was just kind of, I don't know, it was anecdotal, but it was interesting. They have what, so one of the parts of this legislation is they want to correct this by making 770,000 cannabis related records eligible for expungement. There will be automatic expungement for marijuana possession under 30 grams. And between 30 and 500 grams, they're going to have to go to court to go through a process of getting expunged. This is terribly important for people who've been arrested because if you've got that marijuana conviction, it stops you from getting all sorts of employment. You can't go into public housing a lot. I think you can't get student loans. There's a lot of reasons why people want to clean this up. So there was a whole group of people that were really pushing that intently. Um, the process will take different forms. In Cook County, the state's attorney is asking the judge to vacate all eligible marijuana convictions starting with misdemeanors. So that for a group of legislators was, was important. The next sort of pusher on this were people who were looking for economic equity. They again were seeing this as a new business and they want to make sure, quote, that the Illinois cannabis business is not all controlled by white men. Currently, nationally, 73% of the business is controlled by white men. Um, so there is incentives to bring minority workers into it, even if they have a marijuana conviction, and maybe that actually will help them get the jobs. But um, they, they, in in reality, the first licenses are going to people who have current dispensaries. So that's already shutting down out because all of them are owned, I believe, by white men. Sorry. So just saying. Um, the next criteria was new state revenues. It, this is actually way down on the list because it's not really clear how much money we're going to get for taxes because if they tax it too high, people are going to continue to go on the street and get the, um, the product. So they're estimating, I think, up to $500 million we brought in, but in the beginning, they're estimating, I think, around $73 million. But in this state, every penny counts. Um, the next driver was that um, people, it was perceived to be a very popular issue for the governor to, ru to um, run on. People, there seems to be a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. I know staff at Federation came up to me and said, do you really think this governor is going to legalize marijuana? And so, I mean, it was a, it, it was felt to be popular. It turns out at this point, only six in 10 Illinois citizens actually wanted it. But still, the marketing was, let's push it so it will make people happy. And then finally, the most compelling argument that I heard is that, is that prohibition is not working. It was not stopping anyone from getting marijuana who wanted it. They want it to come out of the woodwork. They want it to get heavily regulated and then move forward on it. So that's kind of the drivers behind it. Um, where do we go from here? Um, it is going to be a battle, state, city by city, municipality by municipality, whether they allow or prohibit cannabis sales. In California, which is kind of the pot capital of the country, um, 300 out of 482 total municipalities ban cannabis operators. So for people who are objecting, this is something that can be taken up you know, wherever you have home rule. It won't happen, though, in this city. They've already gone forward on it. Um, this, the second thing is, um, on, the, on the information front, it is so, it, I loved N Nina's presentation when she started about, this cannabis is not your parents' marijuana. There's actually genes that sound, sound like that, but it's like, this isn't your um, marijuana. Um, I think there's a huge lack of public information about the consequences of it. Um, it is, I have never heard of it, even at, you know, it is as though it's being swept under, under the rug, it's equated with alcohol, and we, we don't do a very good job about talking about the potential consequences of alcohol addiction either. So I think there, there's a tremendous need to get the word out. How do you, can you use it sensibly? Can you not, how, you know, wh where do we go from here? Part of our, um, presentation in uh, on November 21st is bringing in some people um, who've run programs up north 
um, and then we're, um, to really talk about what are some successful programs of working with teens about how to regulate it, how to, how to look for it. And then thirdly, the other thing I just want to bring up is vaping. Um, there is a bill um, by Representative Deb Conray. It's HB 3883. Wait, 3883. It's a ban on flavored tobacco, which I think is the way of getting to vaping. Am I right? Yeah. Um, it is up in Human Services Committee on November 12th at 3 p.m. So call your state rep. Um, if they're on that committee, ask them to support. If you, if you think this is a good bill, ask them to support it to get it out of Human Services. There'll be a big push against it because people, not so much from people who want vaping, but more from people who are selling it. Um, so that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter is um, Rabbi Leonard Matanki. Rabbi Matanki is the Dean of the Ida Crown Jewish Academy and Rabbi of Congregation Kins of West Rogers Park. Um, Rabbi Matanki was ordained and received his master's in religious education from Hebrew Theological College, a master's in educational administration from Loyola University, and a PhD from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, New York University. Currently serving as co-president of the Religious Zionists of America, co-chair of the JUF Rabbinic Action Committee, and chair of the Kashrut Committee of the Chicago Rabbinical Council, Rabbi Vitanki is also past president of the Rabbinical Council of America and the Chicago Rabbinical Council. Rabbi Vitanki is the associate editor of a new RCA Sidur called Avodat Halev, which means the work of the heart, which is which came out in 2019, 18, and he is the editor of the Koran Sidur for the House of Mourning, which is um, from 2019, and the author of numerous articles. So Rabbi Vitanki, and I also have to say he's my next door neighbor, so uh, he didn't put that on here, but uh, which is the real reason I'm here today. I'm here as the rabbi, and what I want to really do is just focus on both the question of cannabis and the question of vaping, but focus exclusively from those areas that I know a little bit about. I'm not an expert in addiction. In fact, I hope to get Nina's presentation because I want to share it with others. I'm not an expert in governmental affairs, and there's a lot of things I don't know. But what I do know is a little bit about Judaism and a little bit about our perspective on questions both of cannabis and of vaping. And where I want to start this morning is with a simple position of Judaism. And there's two different ways I can go with it. I could share with you a really nice word from this week's Torah reading, but I'm going to take a different approach. The different approach is really to quote from a source from Rabbi Aaron Barth, he was born in Germany in the late 19th century, moved to Israel before the founding of the state. He occupied many, many important roles, including for the first 10 years of the state of Israel. He was one of the signatories on the, uh, on those days it was the Lira bills of the, of the paper money, because his role was the manager of bank, what became Bank Lumi. But he was also a Jewish philosopher. And he also wrote a very, very important work in the early days of the state. And in it, he tried to explain who we are as a Jewish people and what our task is in this world. And he had a very brief description within there of the role of a Jew. The role of a Jew is to look at life and the way he said was to transform our yetzer, our desires, to ratzon, to conscious decision-making. That everything we do and all of the precepts of the Torah really center around that same concept. God wants us to be in control of our lives. And in fact, that principle you find in many other writings, a simple thing, we keep kosher. Why do we keep kosher? Because God told us to keep kosher. And what's at the center, the center of the laws of kashrut? that we have to be conscious and aware of what we eat. 
there are parameters, there are boundaries, there's limits. We have to be aware. And that applies to every aspect of Jewish life. We have to be aware of how we dress. We have to be aware of how we eat. We have to be aware of how we speak. And when it comes to questions of addiction, those things that are addictive violate that very simple principle of Jewish life because we lose control of who we are. We lose control of our behaviors, of our speech, of our actions. And as a result, any addictive substance that creates that kind of high, that takes away from us the ability of control, is problematic and, and most likely prohibited. Now, the exception, of course, is when it comes to medicinal use. Medicinal use is a whole different ballgame. And so I remember when medical marijuana was about to be permitted, and I sat on the Kashrut Commission of the Chicago Rabbinical Council, and I don't think I'm betraying any confidences about this, and there's a group of rabbis sitting around a table, and the question is raised, should we put a hechsher, our imprimatur, that it is kosher, and supervise the production of products which contain medical marijuana? Now, a group of Orthodox rabbis are going to initially say, marijuana, no which is exactly what we did. But within a few minutes, and as we were gathering more information, the very simple plea came, but people's lives are at stake. And there's a question of being able to relieve suffering. And, it, and how can we not? And so we began to provide a hechsher a kosher certification for medical marijuana. Now, medical marijuana, in terms of kosher certification, there's a number of different issues associated with it. The most obvious are edibles. A lot of the edibles are not kosher by nature, whether it's the gummy bears, the brownies, and they have to have supervision. But even the way that you can extract the THC from marijuana itself involves processes that require kosher supervision because it can be made non-kosher just by doing so. Medical marijuana, though, medicine doesn't have to be kosher, but the edible piece is really the most complicated part around it. But we give it, as do most major kashrut organizations worldwide. We are now facing the recreational marijuana. Recreational marijuana, again, at principle, when you lose control, you lose who you are as a Jew. And that loss of control, by the way, applies to alcohol and any other substance, which is one of the great struggles we have because alcohol can be used for ritual purposes. Wine, for example. Alcohol is used in a celebration of a holiday of Purim and often, unfortunately, abused. And we haven't pr prohibited it. In fact, we provide kosher supervision to alcohol products. So on the handout, one of the things that was passed out to you, there's a statement on recreational marijuana that I co-signed um, that came from the Chicago, actually from a coalition here in the community. And unfortunately, my signature is too large and everyone else has a small signature, so I look like John Hancock in it. But there is on the first page a quote. And I just want to read that quote for you, and translate it a little differently than Rabbi Rosenberg translated. Unlike the ritual use of wine or alcohol, there is no tradition of using such substances under any circumstances and no consideration of Shomer P'taim Hashem. Now, what that really says is that when it comes to alcohol use, it's been used. And for us to come out at this point and say prohibited, doesn't really work. But it also says, it quotes from a verse in Psalms, Shomer Ptaim Hashem, that God guards Ptaim. Now, Rabbi Rosenberg is very generous and translate the word Ptaim as simple. God protects the simple. A better translation, I would suggest, is God protects the fools. That People who have done 
foolish, stupid, dangerous things by use of alcohol, somehow, as bad as things sometimes are, and those who are involved in the community in therapeutic uh, roles know that alcohol is dangerous and there's alcoholism in the Jewish community and alcoholism in the Orthodox Jewish community and it can destroy families and lives. But overall, it's been around. And God somehow has protected the fools who use it. But we don't have that tradition about this new herb or drug, however you're going to define it. And therefore, when it comes to recreational marijuana, we can't say it's permitted. We just can't say it's permitted. Because we're opening a new doorway into another dangerous substance and we're not sure of all of the consequences. Rabbis are not the experts on addiction. But we do know loss of control. And we do know those ideas. And so as a result, we turn back several decades to a statement of one of the greatest rabbinic decisors in America, Rabbi Moses Feinstein, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein of blessed memory. We turn back to him and he forbade the use of marijuana. And he had a number of different issues. And of course, even in the letter we referred to him, and when we referred to him, I knew we would be criticized because people would say, you're using a statement that was from years ago, and the science from years ago was very different than the science of today. And so the basis of what he said doesn't apply to today. And yet, among the reasons he gave for prohibiting the use of marijuana, and specifically the use of marijuana, was the issue of the loss of control. That people who are high on marijuana are not going to be getting to the synagogue to say their prayers at a regular time, are not going to be focusing on their Torah studies, are not going to be behaving the way they should be behaving. Those are things we still know is true. And so even if some of the science which he was presented with on the question of the addictiveness, and again, I was, after signing this letter, I was attacked by a couple of attorneys, defense attorneys, who specialize in marijuana cases, and one of them spent an hour on the phone explaining to me why I was probably one of those p'taim, one of those fools for having signed this letter. The reality is that we still know that there are dangers and we know that there are problems and we have to be very, very careful about these things. And so we can't say yes. Now we are very conflicted because we know there will be elements of the Orthodox Jewish community who will provide a hechsher to recreational marijuana. There are two major agencies in North America that have already indicated they will be doing so. Their reasoning is, it's there. It's legal. It's going to be appearing and people are going to be using it. And our responsibility should be to make sure, if they're at least using it, make sure it's kosher similar to the, the nature of providing a Hechsher certification for alcohol. Locally, we are not taking that position, and I'm not saying that this will never change. I hope it never changes. But locally, we're saying that, right, we do have responsibilities, but our responsibility to provide protection supersedes our responsibility to making sure that things are kosher. Now, that is the big picture in terms of cannabis from the halachic, the, the legal perspective, the Jewish legal perspective. In terms of the question of vaping, I'm not really sure what I can add. It's dangerous. It doesn't provide any positive um, uh, uh, appeal, uh, opportunity, possibility to move forward with anything good. Why should it be permitted? Hearing that oils can damage lungs, so why are we permitting it? Why could, how could we? The current state of vaping is horrific and how uh, it has developed, 
uh, is beyond my belief. And the reason being because there's no oversight of what people are in, in, ingesting via the vaping. It's, it's scary. The last piece, and the last piece where I just want to end on is really an appeal to all of the mental health professionals and educators here today. Um, and I'm going to switch hats for a moment because my initial hat was my, my rabbi hat. I want to switch hats now to my head of school hat, and I appreciate some of our colleagues, my colleagues who are here who work in schools. I work in a high school. Um, teenagers are at greater risk with cannabis. That the re research shows clearly. Teenagers are greater risk with life. That also the research shows clearly. And we need to figure out a way to keep them as safe as possible. But we need to find a way, and now because this is a session specifically focusing on the Orthodox community, that brings the right type of values forward with the children. And so I'm gonna give you one anecdote that happened to me in my school, and one suggestion. That children, that teenagers, would smoke marijuana, that they would vape, that they would drink, that they would use language that's inappropriate, that they would whatever you want to fill in the blank is a given. It's a question of percentages. And any Jewish educator who says it doesn't exist, it isn't happening in my school, isn't la la land, I think that's the technical ter term. It's just a question of the percentages of what it happens. In my school, we went ahead and we posted actually in the washrooms, posters about vaping. Someone showed me the poster. It came from a national agency. I looked at the poster, it looked good. Put it up, it's important. But I apparently, they didn't show me all of the posters. I thought there was one kind of a poster going up. And then I found out, someone, some of the teachers came to me and said, did you really give permission to put those posters up in the bathroom? And I went and I looked at the posters. And within an orthodox setting, to say vaping is dangerous, stay away from it, it'd be a little bit provocative, good, because we're dealing with teenagers. But the language that was used on some of those posters, we would still thank God refer to as language of the street. And we took down the posters. Now, teenagers, of course, looking for something to protest, obviously saw room to protest. Oh, they're taking down, they're, they're denying. No, we're looking for appropriate posters. We're looking for appropriate messages that convey both our value system and the risks that are out there to try to educate the children. So my plea to all of the mental health professionals, we need to be able to communicate the challenges that we're facing with the issues of cannabis, the issues of vaping in a way that is strong, convincing, and appropriate for the Orthodox community. And that means the language we use, the images we present, even the appeal that we make has to be targeted to the audience. And depending, obviously, there's a wide range within the Orthodox community. What might be acceptable at Ida Crown Jewish Academy, which is a co-ed modern Orthodox school, may not be acceptable. Pick the other school you want, okay? But there needs to be that way. And it's both in conversations with mental health professionals when our students come to you or when we provide the presentations for you. And it is also in the materials that we create for them and create for the schools. It's not just about information, it's about how that information is presented. And how that information is presented makes a very big difference. It can't be, for most of our teenagers, just a statement, most of our teenagers, some of it will work, a picture of a rabbi getting up, stop, it's dangerous. But it also can't be using language that is wrong, and it has to have information that's real. Because what they are hearing today is alcohol is worse, cannabis is better, cannabis, they hear, 
is non-addictive. They hear cannabis has great advantages. It actually, it's not a gateway drug. In fact, it actually can help you get off of opioids. They hear all these positive messages and they all might be true, but that's not the whole message. They still need to hear, they need to be informed and they need to feel the people who are speaking with them know the information and have the expertise. And we look to the mental health professionals to help us on that. So from a halachic perspective, cannabis is not permitted or forbidden. It's the way it's being used, medically, appropriately. It has to be used. We do all sorts of things. We, we give people poisons. We just happen to call it by a different name. And we say it's curing a cancer. Medically appropriate. Recreationally, there is debate, but it f flies in the face of who we are as a Jewish community. It is a question of control of ourselves versus just moving after a desire. It's the Yetzer moving into the Ratzon. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Rabbi Matanki. Uh, our last speaker to wrap up for this morning uh, is Debbie Kardash. Uh, Debbie is the REACH Coordinator of Social Work Services. At REACH, Debbie provides consultation and supervision throughout the Jewish Day School System of Chicago to school mental health professionals and administrators. Uh, Debbie facilitates a biweekly group for the community schools, mental health professionals to collaborate. The group provides the opportunity to benefit from a professional learning community, share resources, and receive support. She also serves on a number of coalitions and works with many community agencies to address the needs of the Orthodox community. Prior to coming to work for the in the Chicago Jewish community in 2005, Debbie worked at the WCA, the Evanston North Shore Battered Women's Shelter, doing violence prevention groups. I now hand the microphone over to Debbie. Um, thank you. Good morning. I, I just want to publicly thank the Orthodox Network. They do a tremendous amount of good in the Jewish community. I've been a fortunate member from my um, beginning at the ATT in 2005. And I also want to tell Eddie I'm never following Rabbi Matanki again. Um, he took half my speech, but okay, we're good. So actually, what I'm really going to focus on is the questions. Um, I see a number of our social workers from the schools here participating in the program. And I want to talk about the positives. I'm sitting there, as Rabbi Matanki says, that the Chicago cash organizations will not be providing, at this point, a certification for recreational marijuana. And I'm thinking, I am so happy that I live in Chicago. Um, as much as this is an emerging issue and I don't have much to offer, what I can tell you is we're really thinking very hard about what this will look like. Um, I see nodding heads from group participants where we're talking about what is this going to look like? And as Suzanne so eloquently said, we don't know. The states that have legalized marijuana has no idea where this train is going. So that's what I'm going to offer you. So I first want to talk about how we're framing the issue and then ask some really hard questions that we're asking as a community to let you think about it. So what I want to talk about is how we are framing um, substance use, alcohol, and marijuana, just like we're framing the challenges in like an elementary setting with social media, that kids do not have the cognitive development to make good decisions with Snapchat, but they have access to it that kids do not have the cognitive ability to decide if using marijuana is a good idea or not, and they may have access to it. So what we think about is back to boundaries. It's about what our values are. Thanks again for stealing my talk. Um, what are our values and what are the boundaries that we want to put out there? You know, we had some um, social media challenges in the day school system. I'm sure that shocks all of you. And what we really talked about is parents are assuming that there are boundaries and expectations. Do you know that YouTube regulates nothing? And that the amount of stuff put on there is so vast that they can't get it down so your kid could be watching a murder and a rape and you don't even know about it. So we are doing an education about the world no longer provides boundaries. And we liken that when we look at the legalization of marijuana, 
we're not providing boundaries by law. I'm waiting for them to put up, you know, a, sta- a speed limit and say our recommended suggestion is 60, but we don't want to impede on your rights. So we're losing those boundaries. So our role as Jews and as a school is to help reinstate those boundaries, which is to say there are none. So when you talk to your kid about social media, you need to say, nobody is watching this. So these are our values and these are our rules because they don't have, we all know about executive function, right? We were talking about that, right? It isn't developed. It's what, I think we've upped adolescents to 33, if I'm not mistaken, in some reports. I'm no longer an adolescent. Um, but I want to look at that and say, we're making, we're giving handguns to four-year-olds. So what we're working on is that continuum. How we treat technology and how we talk about that education and how we look at alcohol and substance use needs to be that continuum of how we make decisions where we have that Yetzer and Ratzon, what are our values? And to ask those hard questions. Uh, It's interesting. I sent out an email to the whole group and I said, guys, I'm on a panel about vaping and marijuana. What's going on? And everyone of like, I don't think we're talking about it, but I don't know. So here I am to say, we don't know. We do know that um, I do drive down Lincoln and from a very prestigious synagogue, I'm watching a very prominent member of the community vape it as I pass Lincoln going to Beis Yaakov to drop my kid off. And um, she's clueless, so I don't have to do the whole lecture, you know, when you see bad behavior with the kids in the car. But I'm looking at the going, who else saw him? I'm also hearing that in one um, high school, in the dorm, it's very uncool to vape because some cool kid knows somebody who got really, really sick, so it seems to be not an issue. Um, and I do hear that places are talking about it. I also heard that there was a prominent affair where a prominent speaker was speaking and his young adult children would be like at a head table, kind of like if I started vaping in the middle of this panel in front of 200 students, like what would that look like? So apparently that happened. So we're all over the place. So I want to talk about thinking of it as a continuum of boundaries. Um, I have something I say everywhere. I have never seen a sin or a bad move happen if there wasn't a boundary violation. It may be that you ask me to do a favor and I say yes, and then my whole week falls apart. There was a boundary violation. I couldn't do it. When we look at drugs and alcohol and promiscuity, it's, it always boils down to a boundary violation. We need to set our boundaries up. So as I'm sitting, our, none of our schools are in La La Land, Rabbi Matanki, thank God. They're kind of going, Debbie, what now? This is coming down the pipe. And I'm going, we're going to have to watch. So I'm going to share just a couple of the questions that we ask in supervision. I'm I'm blessed to go to almost every Jewish day school in the Federation system on like a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So these are the questions we ask. So we're looking at marijuana. Um, Nina got a question from a social worker. I forwarded. I said, hi, what is the potency thing? Because shouldn't they be falling over dead with this new THC, right? And she's like, sorry, they're not. The question is, what happens when mom comes to carpool at nursery and she looks stoned? Debbie, what do we do? I'm like, that's a really good question. I have no idea. Has that happened? What happens? We've had this where a child ingested an opioid, a young child, and DCFS got involved. What happens when a kid swallows a pod? When we have edibles, when a kid is at a kiddish and doesn't know that those brownies are not for children, have we thought about these things? So what I'm putting out is we really are thinking people that we need to be sharing our values, that we need to be talking about it. As schools, we need to be, I mean, if you could give me one wish on my deathbed is parent education, which is we need to talk about these things. We know the kids who are experimenting with vaping have access to it. They're taking their dad's vaping stuff. We know that with alcohol. We know that with marijuana. We know that with prescription drugs. Somebody's got candy in the house and somebody's taking it. We need to talk about it. We And we do. And there's a, a forum. A concern I have is what happens when you have a Rebbe or a teacher show up to your school high? What happens when they leave the bong in the bathroom at school? We're going to have to think about these things. Um, This is meant to be that conversation. So as mental health professionals, our job is to model the question, as Rabbi Matanki so beautifully referred to, of what are our values and are we losing our control? And I want to leave a couple of thoughts. I get to work with a lot of adolescents informally. And um, they're questioning this. And my struggle is we've made it, we're going to make it legal, so we've lowered the bar. The bar is now six feet under. 
There's no regulation. We're going to have to follow our own bar. But what about those kids struggling in recovery? The kids who were at risk and were using. And now all they're doing is marijuana. And, and we're sitting with us going, you know, we're jamming and everybody's high. They're all smoking weed. And I want to stop. But it's not as cool to jam when everybody's high and you're not. And how to build that recovering community where it's okay not to be using marijuana and you could still jam really well. And then they're seeing people we view as role models smoking when they get out of show or eating brownies or going to the rabbi of the show. You know, that's, that's not for you. Don't eat that, please. You know, what are we doing with that? So we need to think about it. And as a thought, when we look at loss of control, our job, and I'm going to leave you with this thought, our job is to make children go to, not run from. What are we not providing that that marijuana, that escape, which will only, their goal in life after they're addicted, will be just to get back to normal. What are they running from? We need to help them go to. And, th and that's really what we're talking about. Again, I just want to thank the Orthodox Networking Committee for arranging this. It's a pleasure to work with them so many years. And again, I'm not following Rabbi Matanki. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. And Debbie, we do have that request not to follow Robert Matanki now on tape. So, we, you know, okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So I'd like to open this up now to questions and answers. Um, hopefully lots of questions and hopefully lots of answers. No questions. Oh, wait. Good morning. Thank you to all the presenters and the panelists. That was an excellent presentation. I am somebody who's playing a lot of catch up on this topic. Um, I think we all are. A, a couple of thoughts. I, I think per perhaps Suzanne's presentation brought this out the most. I think this whole question is really representative of where we are as a society in terms of decision making. Uh, no one referred to the experience of the early states that have already had marijuana legalized for a couple of years. Actually, you refer to California, but I think there are some things to be learning. It seems that because of all the reasons that you enumerated and all the interests that you enumerated, and I think we could be sympathetic to the incarceration issue, <coughs> a decision has been made by a greater society that we're going ahead with this. Um, my, my concern for our students is that we are very greatly influenced by what society perceives as good, and we do lend a lot of moral weight to if, you know, if our state legislators think that this is a good idea, then it must be okay. And that becomes compounded by the popularization through social media. We didn't talk a lot about that nexus, the fact that so many kids are making a lot of their moral judgment by, you know, what they see on Facebook, etc. So I think that's a scary thing. To balance that, there's always deviant behavior lurking out there, which people who are unhappy or have a void in their lives are seeking to fill. I think the biggest challenge of our generation is the extreme materialism that we have and the fact that we have so much access to so many things, so we have to deal with it more. You know, alcohol is an age-old vice. It's been around for a long time. You know, Solomon speaks about it too. The fact that we have it in our schools or we will be having it in our schools, I don't know that this problem is that much greater than it's been for years when we had other kids who were unhappy and were doing all kinds of harmful things to themselves. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, schools owning the problem. I don't think that that's what's being said over here. We have plenty of rabbis in the room too. This is a community problem. And I also, in my mind, think that adults are, you know, a big part of the problem. I think Debbie spoke to that, you know, the fact that a lot of kids are going to pick up these behaviors sometimes even unknowingly from the adults in the community. And I think they have to be looked at as two different problems. The fact that society is willing to take all these risks and cross all these boundaries, whether they're religious boundaries or just simple common sense boundaries. And that kids often fall off the, you know, the balcony more quickly because they have you know, less executive function than the adults. Schools in the past, traditionally, when they're faced with any new 
problem that's coming down the pike. We, we set policies. We try to make the normative behavior. And then with the recognition that there are always gonna be kids who are gonna test the boundaries and they're always gonna do whatever you know we ask them not to do. And we have to figure out responses to those things. I think that's really the first response of schools is to acknowledge that this is coming down the pike, create the policies and plan for those policies not being kept. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure what else schools can really do today. And uh, those are some of my thoughts that, are, that I took out of this, thank you. I just want to, uh, one thing I didn't include in my remarks, you know, uh, Debbie kind of jokingly said, you know, adolescence ends at 33 now or something, right? But it's really important to note in terms of brain development that until you're around 25, 26, your brain does not stop developing. And so the impact that these substances have on your brain is rather significant as you develop into adulthood. So those things do need to be taken into consideration as we develop policies and regulations around this issue. Just saying. Thank you. My name is Menachem Linzer. Nice to see everyone. Thank you to the panel. Um, in response to what Rabbi Muller was saying and, and some thoughts I was having, so I'm the principal of an elementary school, Hill Torah, and we, I do believe to what you started with about the, the void and, and what you ended with, Debbie, um, the, you know, what's driving addictive behavior, why are people searching for this? So, you know, I'm a big believer in, big proponent of education, towards social emotional values, starting in the youngest ages before drug, you know, before that's even on the horizon, but healthy social emotional development hopefully is the best preventative for these kinds of, of behavior. And as they get older, it could be more specific addiction prevention programs, you know, that address, you know, these things in a, in a, in a more focused way. What I'm curious to hear from the experts, and again, we do these things in our school. I'm sure other people do it as well. We partnered with JCFS actually on partners in prevention, I believe it's called, um, which we implemented in our school just in the past year or two. It's adding on to all the other programming that we do. But I'm curious to hear is the research or is anyone aware of research on the effects of these programs? Because it seems like the right thing to do. It makes sense. Uh, is there research on the effects of these kinds of programs on the percentage of, you know, how, how effective they are in preventing drug use? And, and obviously every community is going to be different. Orthodox community statistics might look different than a broader society, but uh, I, I'm just going to say that I know what doesn't work more than I know about what does work. I mean, most people have heard of the D.A.R.E. program, and we know, and that, you know, the focus of that program is they often had law enforcement folks go into the schools and talk about substances and the dangers, and the, the focus was, to, you know, was not, you know, fostering, you know, healthy beliefs and values to support their decisions. It was more about scaring folks away from the substances of scaring folks straight. So we know that doesn't work because the, the statistics on DARE are pretty much memorialized and people know about them. I frankly am not aware of what statistics exist around this, you know, what programs are successful in this regard. It's a good question. I wish I had the answer. Uh, just following on Rabbi Linzer, what you said is, I don't have the statistical data, but um, I'm in your school a lot, and I'm in every other school, including your feeder schools, and what we do see is the schools that have social-emotional training or like a sexual development training and all that good stuff, when those kids get a little bit older, like in the junior high or they hit high school and they get into trouble, they're coming to the school professionals. So if they're starting to get into trouble, they're coming. They have a little bit of information to say, hey, I'm on a slippery slope. Now, that's, that's obviously anecdotal, but if that helps you hear that when your kids in Holtower have gotten those resources, when we're consulting in the high schools, those students who are struggling have been identified. So is it prevention? Well, they're, they're, what did, they're gonna mess up. Show me a kid who's not going to make a bad decision, and I'm going to show you someone who's catatonic. So think about that. So so it's anecdotal, and it we need more research on it, but I want 
that's something to hold on as you're investing really core curriculum time in doing the social emotional learning programs, which I'm often selling, by the way, to the school. So this is a commercial. It's working because we're seeing it. I, I see where they tend to nodding that he's seen because of some prevention programs they've done. Students who get into trouble come forward. They tell your parents. They tell an adult in the school. So if that's helpful. I'm Dr. Noah Hemstrom, and although I am so grateful that the um, panel is discussing our builders and what we can do to assure that their um, boundaries are appropriate and consistent with Jewish values, I, I work with the later portion of the population. And I'm wondering if anyone has any comments on the senior, the elderly population, because we know that among the elderly population, alcoholism is a terminal disease. And so it occurs to me that misuse of marijuana or other addictive substances would likely fall in that category. So if you have comments in that area, I would appreciate hearing them. Well, I'm gonna jump right in because that is a very big portion of what I do. Probably 60% of my week is spent working with the older adult population. Um, I am the coordinator or chairperson for the Illinois Coalition on Substance Use and Aging. Uh, I, um, along with my colleagues at JCFS Chicago, developed a program called Empower, which helps Basically, I go and speak to older adults about how to use their medications safely. And I just added a, a few slides and some comments with regard to marijuana. Just yesterday, I did it for a Russian-speaking Jewish group with Ezra. And I was just mentioning to Susan before we started today that when I started talking about marijuana, the temperature in the room rose significantly. There was a certain amount of hysteria and worry because... Again, people just don't know. They don't have the information they need. So I was very glad to be able to provide some. Uh, I also have trained professionals on how to work with uh, older adults who have substance use issues. And we anticipate, just so you know what we're looking at in terms of data, we anticipate that marijuana use amongst older adults, you know, defined as 55 and up, is going to likely quadruple before the year 2030. And that's before we had all this legalization. I suspect it might more, you know, it might be triple or double. So, um, so we're paying a great deal of attention, at least, you know, I, I can only speak for JCFS Chicago. We're paying a great deal of attention to substance use amongst older adults. And we know that marijuana, um, and its components, THC and CBD, are definitely concerning for those of us who work with those folks. You're welcome. A um, question for the panel. We spoke about um, vaping. We spoke about marijuana. I'm curious as to the correlation of the vaping and, in general, smoking and how we're looking at that. <clears throat> I feel like many people think, oh, well, vaping until recently isn't so bad, so they're doing that instead of the smoking. Do we think people are gonna go back to regular smoking cigarettes? How do we address that? What are we doing specifically within the Orthodox community? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I, um, I think the uh, the marketers of vaping did a very fine job on trying to convince people that if you vape, you'll be much healthier because you won't be smoking. Uh, they forgot to tell people that we will kill you with the chemicals um, that the vaping it contains. The issue of smoking in terms of uh, the Orthodox community, Jewish community is also very similar to what I mentioned before uh, in the name of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, in the sense that there was, we saw a development, there was a period of time, some of you uh, may have heard of it, where um, smoking tobacco was considered a very healthy thing to do. That was the initial reaction, and slowly people began to understand that it wasn't. At first they thought it wasn't healthy or not healthy, then we know it kills you. 
Um, and so that same development has happened within the, the realm of the halachic realm. It is, there are people um, who will still say, listen, if a person is addicted to cigarettes, they can continue with their cigarettes. Uh, but to start smoking cigarettes, it's a pretty common reaction within the Jewish legal um, field, the halachic field, that it is prohibited. Um, and I think what I have seen, and this is purely anecdotal, I have seen people who would have been shunned had they been smoking, taking up vaping, um, and feeling that this they can get away with it this way, and becoming addicted to the vaping. I don't know if they would necessarily turn back to smoking, at least in America. Uh, the difference you'll find when you go to Israel and America, Israel, you're still going to get stuck on an elevator with, with one guy smoking a cigarette, and you walk out of there and say, how did we used to do this? In America, there is, I think, pretty, most of society looks down on smoking cigarettes. I don't, I have no evidence for this whatsoever. I have a, a, a gut feeling that if people were to get off of vaping, they, if, if they're using it for a high, they'll find something else to get a high on. But if they're just using it as an alternative, acceptable way instead of smoking, that they won't necessarily work backwards to, to cigarettes. Just a gut. It's still addictive, <laughs> um, even though you may not, you know, the, the, the thing I wanted to add, and I know there's a couple of people that want to ask questions, is that the problem also is, let's say someone has taken up vaping, um, there isn't really treatment targeted towards nicotine addiction, and I know that state funding has been lax, if not non-existent, for a lot of years. Um, I don't know with this onslaught of vaping concern if, if that's, if they're taking another look at that. But I know that recently someone asked me, where can I send my child to get treatment for their vaping addiction, for their nicotine addiction, their vaping? And I was hard pressed to find a place for this youngster. Um, so because frankly, Medicaid and state subsidy will not pay for it. I don't really know even how to phrase this, but it's more um, directed towards Rabbi Matanki and Nina, um, because my own paradigm changed a lot when I was dealing with someone who was a college student who confided in me that they were using marijuana and had been heavily medicated as a as a high school student, you know, through through psychiatry, okay, for depression, ADD, sleeping problems and had started using marijuana in high school. And I actually was in contact with a psychiatrist afterwards. And he said, you know, this is so much better for this kid than to be taking Ambien. And I don't know how much we are pharmacologically aware of what these kids are going through in general. And sometimes it can be a relief for them. And I don't really know how we deal with it. But I don't, I just feel un uneasy when I hear a sort of blanket statement about something not being a healthy choice for somebody when in reality it might actually be healthier. My paradigm shifted totally when the psychiatrist said this to me. And I don't know how we deal with that, but it's just something that I wanted to sort of approach. Yeah, I, I think, by the way, it's very, in some ways, very easy to, to deal with because, again, from a halachic perspective, we're looking at a dichotomy between recreational use and medicinal use. Um, what is frightening is that some that sometimes when children self-medicate, take the marijuana out of the picture, whatever they're self-medicating on, um, that self that self-medication might be medically, psychologically um, appropriate at a certain level, but when they take it to the next level, just because they don't know any better, then it becomes dangerous. So if you're dealing with medicinal use, and if there's some way that it can be measured what the appropriate medicinal use is, and it's needed, well, that's kind of easy. And in that sense, the change in the law can be is beneficial, because it allowed the medicinal use, it allowed these kinds of opportunities for, for children. What I'm, what I'm um, speaking about when I'm the, conveying the position that it's prohibited is where it's purely recreational and it's do whatever you want to do. Let's escape. It's escapism, and escapism like that is not something that we find is uh, is positive. 
I want to speak to the fact that there are only two uses of components of marijuana that are FDA approved and have been thoroughly researched. One is the use of THC in the pill form of Marinol to treat nausea associated with chemotherapy. And the other one that I mentioned earlier, CBD in the use of treating people with children who have epileptic seizures. Nothing else has really received rigorous, rigorous, controlled research. We don't know whether it's better than, worse than, the same as. We don't know. That isn't to say that there isn't encouraging research in the use of CBD for pain relief. That isn't to say that there, you know, there, you know, the fact that we are increasingly legalizing in various places in the country these substances that maybe that will promote more and better research. But I, I'm worried about recommending things when we don't know. You know, the research just isn't there to support the use. You know, Medicinal marijuana in the state of Illinois is approved for f over 40 maladies, things like post-traumatic stress disorder. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, if you take too much, you will become psychotic. So I, I'm just, uh, I'm concer personally concerned about the lack of research on these substances. Um, I do to validate what Nina said. Um, I was fortunate before my life here, I worked with chronically mentally ill um, patients in an intermediate care facility. And I had one client that I kept for a number of years. Um, by kid number five, I discharged him. Um, and he was schizo, he suffered from schizoaffective. And, um, I was blessed to have a background in addiction treatment in grad school, um, under Carol Hoffman, for people who know. And I remember calling her several years later saying, you know, he needs harm reduction. I can't, I can't keep advocating absence because he can't do it. But I remember saying, Rich, you got to stay away from the pot because you're psychotic and it's going to just put you over the edge. So I think we need to really think about the psychosis piece that comes, especially in the adolescent brains. This was a grown adult, but he had a, a psychotic disorder. And I think we need to be really cautious because it's really dangerous. Kids having psychotic episodes are really scary and we're not talking about it much. Um, I'm not thinking we're covering it up, but if I hear one more time about a panic attack, okay, this ain't no panic attack, okay? So let's, or, or he had some heart issues. Yes, he's having a psychotic episode. Let's kind of treat that. So I guess I, I can't be passionate enough about research and we, we don't know what we're doing. And that's where a good psychiatric evaluation comes in and helping them maintain treatment and, and holding them as we develop a protocol for kids who are really suffering. And we see that in our schools, we're using a lot of partial hospitalization programs. We're using a lot of intensive therapy programs. We're looking a lot at the addiction component because we know that them self-medicating is the highest risk. Hi, my name is David Clough. I'm with the Village of Skokie Health Department. Uh, I want to thank you guys for hosting this. Also, Nina, I'm a C4 veteran from when you ran Recovery Point, so thank you for being here. Um, I, I wanted to speak to the uh, to the vaping epidemic that we're seeing, and uh, you guys really provide the perfect lead into this. Um, the absence of data isn't good data, and this is an old tobacco industry tactic. There's a window where we go, well, we don't have the research yet. Guess what? They get a generation of smokers and revenue in that four to five year window. What they're doing with vaping is the same thing they did with the tiny cigars in the 90s and Lotar and Virginia Slims in the 80s, all the way back to your physician recommends Chesterfields in the 50s. Um, intuitively, we're looking at vaping going, well, it's probably better than your regular cigarette, but still not great for you. What's happening now, it's coming out, it might be a great deal worse. Uh, there've been thousands of young people ending up in ERs with a, a respiratory illness that we can't quite define or figure out what the common ingredient is. And there have been 800 deaths from this nationwide, including, uh, I believe, three in Illinois at this point. Um, I wanted to stress uh, HB 3883, which uh, Mara brought up. 
please support that because a lot of the way this is becoming a gateway is not just bad information and kids believing it's water vapor. Uh, it's better defined as inhaling an aerosol than a, a water vapor. But a lot of the way it's getting, people are getting hooked is kids as young as fifth and sixth grade are getting offered something that's gummy bear or cotton candy flavored. We're all grown in this room. If you offer me a chemical I don't know so I can taste cotton candy, I'm going to say no. A kid might. Um, banning flavoring and vaping products can go a long way to reducing initiation. So I would just say the, the Skokie Board of Health, the trustees, we've, we've uh, signed something uh, supporting the, the initiative to ban flavorings, and I would encourage everyone else to come out in support of, uh, of Bill HB 3883. Thank you. Two comments. Um, in terms of the va the vaping bill, what we can do is through David and also Zivia, um, through the, the schools and also to the network, we can send out a link to the bill and also give you instructions on how to sign on for it or against it, sorry, <laughs> against it. Um, for it. For it, yes, for it, yes. Sometimes, yes. So I was correct. Yes, a ban. Um, so we can do that. It's easier. It's kind of several steps you have to go through, and some people don't know how to to do that. And then also, secondly, with the rules and regulations around the um, recreational marijuana, we can keep our eye on that. We don't think it's out yet, um, but when it does come out, we can also send it out to the networks and help you figure out how to write comments or if you have any input on it that you want us to um, add to it. So obviously, we're not taking a position on this, but we're, in terms of federation the network, but we're keeping our eye on it because it's going to affect you know, our network in various different ways and also bring in state revenue. Um, you know, part of our job too is to provide technical, assist technical assistance to our agencies. So very similar like how we did with the Invest in Kids um, Act and help translate that. So we're happy to do that. And um, I have my card here. I can, or various people here like David or Zivia also have my information. I have two questions. I'm not sure exactly who it's directed to. One of them has to do with the cost of actual cigarettes versus vaping versus marijuana in terms of the mindset of a young adult, adolescents, because I think that's more of their motive of not thinking the consequences, but like, hey, I have $5, what can I get for that? So is there anything known about that? And then the second question is the money that is coming in from regulation what is the plan, the government? Do, are they going to be doing any prevention work? Are they doing anything productive with that to help the society? Sorry. Okay, so there's three. There's a 3% tax on it that's going to go to the state, and then municipalities can include their 3% tax. And some of that will go to um, prevention programs. And I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't. But, but I... I do think, actually, to Mara's point, it's very easy to sign in in support of a bill electronically. It will take you five minutes. It's coming up in committee on Tuesday. I think it will make a difference if a lot of people weigh in. Um, because the mood is not in Springfield. This room would be, they would be shocked to hear this. It's all kind of rejoicing. So... Need, need to kind of get the word out there. Vaping is a little bit different because there's been these high-profile deaths, but still. So I'll find out more about that, what percentage. Okay. That Hi. Um, I'm part of our addiction services uh, prevention programming. So the cost of a Juul um, or a vaping device averages about 15 to $30, which needs to be purchased only once. And then every pod that goes into a Juul to be smoked can carry the equivalent of a, uh, the amount of nicotine as what is found in two packs of cigarettes. So there is a direct correlation to the amount of nicotine and those pods are about five to eight dollars a piece, depending on the flavor. So if you're, I don't know how much a pack of cigarettes costs anymore, but if it's 12 to 12 ish dollars, um, for one pack of cigarettes, you basically can get the equivalent of two packs worth of nicotine for about 10 bucks to be smoked in a jewel pod, which is a vape, uh, vaping device. 
so it's actually cheaper, I guess. I'm not that good at math, but I just wanted to give you some of the numbers. Wow. Okay, thank you. And I, my name is Shmuel Tenenbaum, Dean of Students, Yeshiva Tzvaris Tzvi. Very much appreciate everything that was said here today. Um, my question is probably geared to Mara and Suzanne. Um, we do believe that mar marijuana, vaping, gaming coming up as well, these are all behaviors. The behaviors that children are exhibiting are, as Debbie always says in groups, behaviors communicative. When a child behaves a certain way, they're communicating a message. The message that the child is communicating is that my needs are not being met. I need more outlets. These are all outlets, non-healthy outlets. They may be short-term excitement, but long-term effects. If that's the case, and children are acting out, and it's a behavior, we do understand that many families today are stressed. There's a tremendous amount of stress going on, large families, low-income families, even without it, just technology causes stress. So there is so much stress that children are struggling with that any outlet that they can get their hands on that will reduce some of the stress, they're not thinking of the consequences, as we heard. So if that's the case, can we try to work in Springfield to help with funding, not only with prevention, but more healthy outlets? If you take a look at our JCC building here that hasn't been renovated in 60-something years, this is a healthy outlet. And we're not putting much money into our healthy outlets. Instead, the, the, the vaping companies are the ones that are making the money. The entrepreneurs of cannabis are making money. So let's take healthy money and put it towards healthy outlets so as to, our kids and our young adults don't have to go to unhealthy outlets. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we are working to get capital money so that we can update the um, Bernard Horowitz and other other things. Where, and if you're on the Facebook with uh, the JCC, you will know that you should be sending a comment to your local state senator. Um, the whole issue in Illinois, though, of funding for prevention programs, for any kind of teen programs, really is problematic. We have underfunded and cut our funding for health care and human services significantly. And we need to hear it. You're, they need to hear that it's a priority. Um, the, Cause I, and that's, I'm not going to go off on that. That could be a whole nother topic, but I really, yeah, anything that you can say to your elected officials, let them know. Okay. I also do want to add on, um, in terms of recreational, yes, we are financially kind of strapped, the state of Illinois, but on a positive side, we are part of a coalition, the Healthy Minds, Healthy Lives Coalition, in which we passed um, work with them to pass some mental, some really good mental health legislation these last few years. And last year, um, we helped pass legislation that expanded kind of cr crisis services to youth and um, youth, children and youth that are in crisis to help expand that both on the Medicaid side and on the private insurance side. So we can send that information out so that we are, you know, working, you know, legislatively to provide some kind of services or, or beds or in other, in other ways to kind of help with um, the crises that kids are going on. Um, I think it's my turn. Uh, my name is Beth Fishman. I'm the manager of the addiction services and the other half of addiction services at JCFS Chicago with Nina, which was my honor and pleasure. Um, so uh, I have a couple of holes that I might be able to fill in, but I want to start with a little anecdote um, with regard to YouTube videos um, that Debbie mentioned. I have a 14-year-old daughter, and last week she was watching a YouTube video that her school told her to watch. And YouTube recommended another video for her to watch. So she clicked on the recommended video that came from the school mandated video. And it was of a simulated suicide of a teenager. My daughter has an anxiety disorder and didn't sleep for three nights. This is what YouTube does without boundaries. And we have boundaries in my home. <laughs> so it is a, a truly a danger to our young people. And I just thought I would share that. Yeah. Um, and so for young people, I also wanted to mention, um, again, in support of what has been mentioned before, that adolescence is a time of increased risk for psychosis across the board. So anything that young people do that might increase the risk of psychosis when they're already at high risk is of tremendous concern. 
and these high potency THC pods and other products do produce psychosis in general. So you add those products to a high risk population like young people and the use therefore of THC vapes or dabs in adolescents is, uh, is hugely concerning. Okay, as far as um, vaping and traditional cigarettes, that's Doriana, um, the research shows that adolescents who begin to use vaping products become very quickly addicted to nicotine, if nicotine is in the pod, because the amount of nicotine in the pods, as Dawn said, is so high. So what the research is showing is that teenagers who vape are much more likely to use traditional cigarettes because that's another source of nicotine. So it's certainly not reducing the amount of traditional cigarette use. The vaping uh, companies initially suggested they were putting these products out to reduce the use of traditional cigarettes in adults, for what that's worth. <laughs> um, of course, now we know that vaping is not less dangerous than traditional cigarette use to the lungs. And there's also not any really good research across populations to suggest that adults who are using traditional cigarettes are using less of those if they start to use e-cigarettes or, or vapes. Um, so none of the promises from the vaping industry have come to fruition. Um, Prevention program outcomes, as Rabbi Linzer mentioned, very, very difficult because prevention program outcomes require research across long, long periods of time. And as Suzanne suggested, governments aren't really interested in supporting, financially supporting long, long periods of time for prevention outcome research. Um, nonetheless, we know from other prevention uh, research programs that um, education does ultimately produce better positive decision making and um, outreach for help when one is in trouble. So we do have that strong information from other types of prevention programming. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say that Mina and Dawn and Anne Luban, our department chair, and others in the community services at JCFS Chicago, having a lot of discussions internally as well as with Jewish organizations here in Chicago across the board on providing information to support proactive policies. As Rabbi Moeller said, so important to put policies in place now in anticipation of the legalization of recreational marijuana that's coming on January 1st. So we're providing information, staff training, community training, student support and education, lots of different support for lots of different organizations here in the Chicago Jewish community to put proactive policies in place and start shoring up all of our uh, components in our community in anticipation of this change because it's the fact that it's a change. It's not necessarily marijuana itself, but the fact that it's changing its status in our lives that means we need to be thinking proactively and differently about it. So if you have questions or find ways that we can support your organization or your populations, please get hold of Nina or Dawn, myself, and uh, Naomi, Marsha. We're all happy to um, help you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to wrap up, and um, I would like to thank everyone for those thought-provoking questions, um, and I'd like to thank everybody on the panel um, who... Oh, wait, I'm taking Mark's job. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Um, so I'm Mark Swatez, executive director of the ARC, and yeah, I want to thank, in addition to our panelists, I also want to thank JC, JCFS Chicago and Ed himself for doing a great job, the Orthodox Network, and of course, all of you for being here. Um, you know, it, I learned a lot this morning. I think some takeaways that I'm doing is there's so much we don't know. I can't, I think everybody said, you know, there's a lot we don't know. Um, the absence of data isn't good data, Rabbi Muller. You know, we're all playing catch up, I think, um, you know, like everybody else here. Um, you know, there's the thing that came up over and over. I think everybody mentioned the word control. You know, control seems to be really be the central issue for this whole thing. Nina talked about it in terms of access, um, in terms of dosage, you know, how do we control dosage? Um, Mara and Suzanne talked about regulation, you know, controlling the lawyers, controlling entrepreneurs, but also, you know, controlling cannabis um, within the community. Um, Rabbi, you know, Rabbi Matanki, who I think, you know, knows a little bit about Judaism. Um, he talked about controlling our lives, 
um, you know, controlling what we put in our bodies. And finally, Debbie talked about controlling the boundaries, you know, and that came up a lot in the conversation here, um, you know, establishing boundaries for our kids, for the community leaders, and of course, for ourselves. So um, again, we'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, there's a, a evaluation form on your tables. Please fill that out. It's actually very, very important to us. We use these to help um, suggesting other our forums to know how we're doing today. It's our 13th forum. It's our bar mitzvah. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's a good thing to do. Um, if you took one of those little cards, please return it to us. We get in trouble if they're gone. If you want to know more, more about the Orthodox Network, talk to Marilyn, talk to David, talk to me, talk to any of us who are here. Um, we've got a few minutes left in this room. You know, we officially ended 11 o'clock. So please stick around, um, do some speaking with our panelists, informally talk to each other. Um, we're just all so happy that you were all here. So thank you again. <laughs>